The Old Testament is an epic without parallel covering several millennia. Several millennia is covered. In fact, a couple of millennia is covered just in book number one. There probably isn't, from, from my recollection, I don't know if anyone else out there knows of an example where there probably hasn't ever been a history book or a book of human history or the human story that covers about that wide uh, of actual history as the Old Testament does, at least not in religious texts, uh, at least as far as they're concerned. It covers several, at least three and a half, four millennia. If not, we don't know how much more. And a lot of that is covered in book number one in Genesis. The Old Testament rides the tide of empire after empire, rises and falls and begins to interact with the people who are called by God's name. At the heart of the Old Testament is a covenant that God entered into with a man called Abram, or who will soon be known as Abraham. And Abraham would be promised that he would receive a son by the miracle power of God and his son and his descendants would outnumber the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore and his numbers and his descendants, his his posterity will be an elect people for God. And of course we, we follow the story and we know that Abraham's son Isaac had a son Jacob and Jacob wrestled with God and the spirit of the Lord changed his name to be Israel. And so a nation is born and blossoms into the the people of God based upon a covenant God made with Abraham and the majority of the text in the Old Testament will trace this journey of this elect people, these people of God and how they interact and keep covenant with their Lord and Almighty God. These people are a unique nation specifically called by God to receive the oracles of God and his divine favor. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, I'll I'll quote it for you. Paul says this, verse 1 and 2, then what advantage has the Jew? You remember Romans 1 and 2, Paul has labored chapter 1 to show that all the Gentiles in the world, that's the non-Jews, everyone who's not a Jew is guilty before God, right? Paul labors that and shows that. And then Romans chapter 2, Paul shows that, and the Jews who have the law are also lawbreakers. They have not kept covenant with God. So that Paul can summarize, all have sinned, all have fallen short, there's none righteous, no, not one. And then Paul asks the question, Romans 3, what advantage is there in being a Jew? Is there, is there any advantage at all? Is there any benefit derived from that at all? And this is Paul's answer as he goes on and says, what is the value of circumcision much in every way, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So the purpose and a a primary function of God calling Abraham the man of faith, God calling him out and summoning him to be a recipient of God's grace, and then God calling his descendants and his posterity to be the, the nation of Israel, a primary purpose of that is so that God can inscripturate His word. It's so that God can give to humanity His revealed word called Scripture, called the Bible. So when we trace the story of the Old Testament, we're looking at the nation of the Jews, the the Israelites and the, the covenant people of Abraham. And we're also looking at why they matter so much. It's because they exist at all that we even have a Bible at all. And so Paul adequately elucidates this reality. God would promise the Israelites favor. God would promise them advantage. God would promise them his blessing. God would promise them that they would be his unique people if they kept covenant. And they almost never did. So the Old Testament isn't just a story of Israel, but it's a tragic story. It's a story of grave tragedies. These Israelites, these people of God, these descendants of Abraham suffered exile twice The land, their own land, was ravished and devastated countless times. A story of tragedy as God would call them time and again to be faithful as his wife, and yet they would constantly refuse and fall into their error and sin. And yet the story, the entire story, is all about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the summary and the sum of it all. The substance and the fulfillment of it all. The object and the subject of it all. If Paul says in Romans 3 that the advantage of being circumcised, the advantage of the Israelites is it was to them that was entrusted the oracles of God. It is also from them that we have God's final word in Revelation. God's own son, Jesus Christ. 
All types, all shadows find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And the history of the Old Testament, the overarching narrative, find its fulfillment in him. So much so, in fact, that Jesus can say himself in John 5.38, he can speak to those who have refused to believe. He can speak to those people that have devoted their life to studying the Old Testament. Some of these Pharisees had memorized the entire first five books of the Old Testament, nearly 200 chapters. And Jesus can say to these people who were well and truly acquainted with the Old Testament, he can say in John, recorded in John 5.38, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. So the motive is revealed. These people seem to have a pretty noble idea. They want to go to the Bible. They want to go to the Old Testament, study it, memorize it, understand it, study it more, memorize it again and understand it greater and teach it and rewrite it and all this. And they do all that because they want eternal life. Jesus says, you do this, you think that in the scriptures you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. In other words, you have not studied the Old Testament correctly. You haven't understood the Old Testament correctly unless on every page and in every story and in every moment you can see Jesus Christ. He is the subject and the object. He's the fulfillment and the purpose of of at all. In fact, the Old Testament was written in expectation of the one, the great one, the almighty one, the one where God would promise. God said, I will tabernacle myself among you. I will come down as the great prophet and I will dwell in the midst of my people and I will be one with them and I will redeem them. And these prophecies now we call messianic prophecies. They speak to the Messiah calling of Jesus Christ. Christ. In fact, somewhere else Jesus will say to his own disciples in Matthew 13, 16, Jesus will say, but blessed are your eyes. Now these people are looking at Jesus. They can see Jesus Christ in the flesh. And Jesus said, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, listen to this, don't let this uh, escape your concentration, your attention right now. This is very profound. Jesus said this, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it. And hear what you hear and did not hear it. The entire history of the Old Testament, from Adam and Eve all the way through to the final prophets, are speaking about the coming of the One, a Messiah, a Savior, a Lord, a King, a prophet, a priest. But all the more, He's God in flesh. And Jesus can say to these people, you're looking at me, you're hearing from me, but you do not even know how profound a blessing that is. The tens and the hundreds of thousands of great righteous people and prophets and, and priests and people who've lived for centuries and millennia past have longed to see me. I am the fulfillment. I am the consummation. I am the final word from God. The story finds its conclusion in Jesus Christ. In fact, the well-known passage in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3 reads like this. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. And after making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This phraseology here in verse 1 speaks of long ago, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. This is an idiom. This is a, this is a way to speak of the Old Testament. Jesus will call it the law and the prophets. Sometimes it's just called the prophet. Sometimes it's just called the law. But here we have in Hebrews chapter 1 this revealed reality that in many times in the past God th spoke through prophets and gave His word and it was entrusted to the Israelite people. But in this final hour, in this last time, He says, God has spoken to us by His Son. A Son who is no less than the radiance of God the exact imprint of God's nature, and a one who, by His Word, upholds the universe. So in other words, the easy way for me to get out of this tonight is just say to you, the summary, the overview of the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ. 
But that's not quite going to satisfy many of you, and I understand why, because there's still so many questions that are, that are appearing. The Old Testament begins in creation. It begins with the narrative of how God created the physical realm and the physical world. That God, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth. We know the story and we understand it to some degree that God then fashioned man from the dust of the earth and breathed life into him. And upon failing to find a perfect companion for Adam, he then made Adam fall asleep and created his spouse, his helpmeet, his wife from the side or the, the rib of Adam, the first man. That Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden in perfect, peaceful harmony having freedom and the will from God to eat of all the trees in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But yet the serpent was more crafty than they and the devil, Satan himself, invaded this garden, invaded paradise and deceived them. Primarily by asking Eve, did the Lord really say you can't eat of any of the trees? He knows that's not true. And Eve correctly responds and says, of course, we can eat of all the trees in the garden, but of this tree we cannot eat. And then the devil begins to weave his pernicious, wicked lie to deceive Eve, and in turn, Adam falls, and we have what we call the lapse of humanity. All humanity is fallen in Adam. All humanity succumbs to the, the wickedness and the depravity of the, the fall of our first parents. And so the Old Testament begins, the story starts in creation and glory and spectacular demonstration of the, the power of God by His Word. He creates the world and sustains the world. And then Adam and Eve fall and the entire thing becomes the tragedy. Generations later, God will flood the entire world and recommence through one man and his family, Noah. We're told he's a, a preacher of righteousness and went about for decades and decades and decades declaring that the end was nigh, that God was going to reign on the earth and flood all the inhabitants. Everything that breathes air into its nostrils will perish by the great deluge of the judgment of God. And yet Noah could only compel and convince him and his family as they entered the ark and God indeed flood the world and the entire world was destroyed except those who were upon the ark. And the story will roll on and unwind for 39 books. A story of tragedy. The story of the greatest romance, the greatest redemption, the greatest narrative ever written, written no less than by the very hand of God. God saves his people. That's the good news. The story is summarized in this cataclysmic ending that God saves His people. Inevitably, always, finally, without failure, He will save His people. But I would say if we're looking at an overview of the Old Testament, and that's what we're striving to do this evening, and I'm doing the very best that I can, I would say that one of the gravest questions that occurs to people when they encounter the Old Testament is, how's God saving people? When we come to the New Testament, I, I doubt that there's very many who can read the New Testament and come away with a, a really clear understanding that God's saving people through Jesus Christ, through G Jesus' own death, His burial and His resurrection, and all who trust in Christ are saved. But then it seems to create this dichotomy because so often under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, under the Old uh, Dispensation, so to speak, so often we, we get this idea that God is proclaiming some form of salvation by achievement, by merit and by works. And I would argue that that is a false view of the Old Testament. In fact, not only would I argue that, but I think the New Testament argues that as well. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bible to Hebrews with me to chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11. And if at this point you've guessed you are right, we're overviewing the Old Testament tonight and we will not read a single verse from it. Ironic. Hebrews chapter 11. Often spoken of as the, the hall of faith, the, the great chapter of the heroes, the patriarchs, the godly men, the godly women of faith. Now what's going on here, I need to just lay down some context real quick before we dive into the actual text, is because the reality is the, 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 the letter of Hebrews is written for a distinct purpose. It's written to Jewish people, to Hebrew people in the first century, after Jesus has gone on to ascend to be at the right hand of his father, the church of Jesus Christ in the first century was vastly Jewish, predominantly Jewish. 
And there was a significant number of these Jewish people in the church in the first century who were struggling to understand how we take the Old Testament and interpret it with the New. How we take the Old Testament story and understand it in Jesus Christ. Now that's hard enough for you and I, but to complicate matters in the first century is these people are being hunted down and hounded by the Roman government. It's pretty hard to crank out a lot of systematic and biblical theology when you're running for your life. That's why the author of Hebrews has written the letter to the Hebrews. The reality was, under Roman rule, under what's known as the Pax Romana, the the peace of Rome, the Jewish religion had amnesty. They had amnesty to practice their religion and to not profess the lordship or the deity of Caesar. But the Christian religion didn't. And so here are these Jewish people, these people who've come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's Peter, maybe it's James. One of the apostles has has preached convincingly and has, has compelled them to become Christians and they've believed. And now they realize that this Pax Romana, this this peace and this amnesty that they enjoyed under Rome has now been snapped out from underneath them like a rug. As Jews, they were not persecuted or molested in the empire. As Christians, it's a different story. This is the entire reason why the entire letter of Hebrews was written, was to compel these Jewish Christians to not go back. There's nothing back there. There's nothing left in the shell and the shadow of the Jewish religion. It is all summarized and found in Jesus Christ. So the letter of Hebrews is written to be a a compelling argument, a a polemic to compel these Jews. Don't return to the old form of things. Don't return to the old priesthood. Find the priesthood of Christ who is an enduring priest. And then the question arises around Hebrews chapter 11. Is there any difference really as to how God's saving people under the old system than under Christ? This is the reason why Hebrews 11 says, was written. It's not just a great little chapter full of biographical sketches to inspire you. I'm happy if it does that, but there's a far deeper purpose going on here. Let's have a look at this. Now, by faith, the assurance of things hoped for, now, sorry, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, faith, the people of old receive their commendation. The people of old receive their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now the author of Hebrews here is going to go way back. He's going to wind the clock right back and start at Abel. At Abel. Let's have a look verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts and through faith Though he died, he still speaks. Through faith. Verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith it's impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. I do hope that the repetition is finding a a home inside your heart. Let's keep reading here. Verse 8, By faith Abraham obeyed what he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out and not knowing where he was going, by faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him as to the promise. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. We go on and the story continues. I'm not going to read it all uh, verbatim this evening. We talk about by faith, Sarah goes ahead and trusts in God. These all died in faith. Verse 13. Not having received the things promised. And this is a profound phrase. Because it's already spoken about Abel who made a just sacrifice. Right? Abel, Abel performed a, a good sacrifice. His motive was clean and upright. Cain didn't. Cain was angry. Cain killed him. You know the story. 
It's spoken about Noah, who by faith built the ark. He was warned by God of the impending flood. He constructed the ark and God redeemed him. It's spoken about faith of Abraham. He went out from his country, the the Ur of the Chaldeans, and out he went into the new land, the promised land. And by faith, he lived in tents and God gave him and Sarah a child. So it seems if we look at it in the natural, it seems if we look at it just from the human perspective, it seems that they all pretty much got what they were after. They all pretty much got what they were promised. And yet, verse 13 has this profound phrase, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. There's something vastly more celestial that's being spoken of here. This is not speaking of these people, these patriarchs, these heroes, men and women, who by faith God gave them things in their life, children, lands, offerings, goodness, an ark. But rather by their faith, they have received an inheritance in a celestial city. So we know that whatever the author is speaking of here, these men and women have received is far greater than the temporary promises that the Old Testament most naturally reveals. We continue on and it speaks of the faith of Abraham. By faith, verse 20, Isaac invoked the future. By faith, Jacob, verse 21. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph. Verse 23, by faith, Moses. We've got to read this. Listen carefully to this. By faith, Moses when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of of sin. Verse 26 is so clear. You couldn't miss this if you tried. Look at verse 26. Speaking of Moses, he considered the reproach of What's the name? The reproach of who? The reproach of Christ. You know how many centuries this is before Christ is to be born in Bethlehem of the virgin woman? You know how far back this is? How is Moses considering Jesus at all? Well, the author tells us he's doing it by faith. The Moses, we're told in verse 26, is considering the reproach of Christ. He's considering that reproach greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And it goes on and it speaks more about the the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry land because of their faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Verse 31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with the disobedient, but she was given a friendly welcome because she gave a friendly welcome to the spies. Verse verse 32, this is how you know, whoever's writing Hebrews, this is how you know he's a preacher. Look at verse 32. Look at the way this is worded, right? This guy's a preacher. What more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. This guy's a preacher, right? He's like, I want to see, I'm writing this out by hand. I just want to tell you all of these stories. But the reality is every single one has the same end. They, through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some tortured because they refused to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. This is all about the heavenly city. This is all about the eschatological end. Hebrews 11 is summarizing for you and me the entire Old Testament and it's telling us that every single one by faith was looking at the celestial Jerusalem which will come out of the sky and dwell and inhabit the new earth where all with resurrected bodies through Jesus Christ will dwell therein in perfect righteousness. Some people people find this confusing. Well, I, Craig, I read the Old Testament. I don't read any of that. I don't read any of that at all. I, I read about Moses. I read about Abel, Noah. I read about Sarah and Rahab the Prost. I read these stories. I get it. But I never got that. 
I want to tell you tonight, I want to tell you as clearly as I can. If you only read and study the Old Testament in light of the Old Testament, without the revealing power of the Holy Spirit and the grand object of Jesus Christ, the best you can become is a Pharisee. That's the best you can be. Because here's the reality, the overview of the entire Old Testament is that some even refuse to be released so that they might rise again to a better life. It's about the resurrection. It's about salvation. It's about Jesus Christ. We should read on, verse 36. Others suffered mocking, flogging, even chains, imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two. Killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All of these, right, verse 39 is the big summarizer. All of these. And when it says that, I want you and I to think this evening of the entire 39 books of the Old Testament. All of this. Here's the overview. Here it is. These People who trusted, who believed, who by faith, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us. That apart from us, they should not be made perfect. In other words, there's a distinction. There's a drastic distinction from you and I who are alive today, after the cross of Jesus Christ, we speak of a gospel story in retrospect. We speak of that man who was fully God, who was the Messiah, who lived that sin-free life, who laid down his life on the cross, who spilt his blood and was buried in a tomb and rose again in glory. If we believe in him, trust in him, we will be saved. That's the gospel. But we are told that all these heroes, all these people, men and women of faith, and the list goes on. The author of Hebrews says, I don't have time to list them all for you. But the reality is they were not striving for a, a promised land somewhere in Canaan. That was part of the covenant, yes. They were not striving for shadows and types. They were not striving for metaphors. They were striving for salvation. They were striving to be made perfect by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, it says it so clearly, verse 40, I'll read it again. Since God had providing something better for us. What, what's the something better? The new covenant. Jesus himself said when he spoke to those who were sitting there, listening to him, seeing him, Jesus said, you know the amount of people that, that, that just desperately wanted to see what you see and hear what you hear? The prophets of old pined to be able to witness and see the God-man, God tabernacled in flesh, God localized in a body, God here and now. That's something better. The gospel is more profound. The gospel is more glorious. The covenant is greater and the covenant is better when it speaks in retrospect. But all these men and women, all of this Old Testament story, the entire narrative still points to Jesus Christ. That those who trust in Him, those who believe in Him, the text tells us, they will be made perfect. Perfected not by themselves as we, we understand this. They're not made perfect intrinsically. They're not, they're not made perfect, but they are imputed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's no less a miracle for God to take the righteousness of Christ, sacrifice 2,000 years ago, and impute it to you today. That's a profound miracle. When any sinner today trusts in Jesus, God credits to them the full righteousness and perfection of Jesus. And yet it's no more a miracle for those who live before the time of Jesus to still trust in Christ and God to impute to them the righteousness of Christ. Salvation has always been through Jesus Christ. That's why when we go through this 39-week series, 40 including our overview tonight, every single night our goal and our objective is to find and point to the cross. That's kind of like what Spurgeon used to say when he used to preach. He'd say, I get up there, I announce my text, and I make a beeline for the cross. It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. None of us have any excuse to suffer that condemnation that Jesus announced against his detractors. 
where he said, you study the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's they that bear witness to me. They all speak of me. So that will be our objective. Salvation is by the grace of God through faith in the sacrifice of the God-man, Jesus Christ. That's the summary of the Old and New Testament. Would you pray with me as we ask God to bless our intro, our exposition of Scripture and our time together this evening? Father, we thank you for Scripture. We thank you, Lord God, for your, your grace, your immeasurable mercy. None of us have earned anything from you, Lord. None of us deserve anything from you. And yet we know, Father, that the offer of the gospel is that free life comes through trusting in Jesus Christ. And our, our duty this evening, Father, is to demonstrate our gratitude as we look back to Jesus. We look back to Him and His sacrifice. And, and we realize what that means to be under that new and better way, that, that clearer, more objective, more explicit gospel proclamation. But yet, Father, we've seen that the Bible teaches us that the gospel although it was communicated through types and shadows and analogies and metaphors in the old system, under the Old Testament, we understand that even them, even they could not be perfected by their works. They couldn't be justified by their merit. They couldn't be saved by their law-keeping, but only through faith in Jesus Christ. Many of them, Father, never even knew the name, but they knew that you would send a Messiah. They knew that you would send a Redeemer. They knew that you would send another Moses, another David, another Elijah, another Jeremiah, a prophet, a priest, and a king. And Father, you have sent such a one. So above all tonight, Father, our thanks, although we've thanked you for Scripture, we thank you for your mercy. We, above all, thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the be-all, the end-all, who is the fulfillment and the consummation of all of Scripture. Every word, every line, every book speaks of Jesus Christ. Christ. I pray, Father, that as we commence this series together, I pray that for the majority of us, if not all of us, that we we stick to it, we have some steadfastness, we commit to this, and we work our way through now the coming weeks ahead in our growth, our learning, our maturing as to how to understand Scripture. And I pray, Father, above all, that we we would all the more be made in the likeness of Christ, conformed to His image through our own Uh, growth in knowledge and maturity. All this we pray to your glory in the name of Jesus and all who agreed said, Amen.